you doing, bud? No, we're gonna get grease on you. Get back. You sit. Oh, sit behind the, you camera shy? From Mooresville, Indiana, he drives the Daystar Directional Drilling, Edco General Contractors, Collision Concepts, BooyahDarts.com 35, it's Zach Hampton. All right, so we're ready to square this rear end and get it in place. I'm going to show you a couple things like the bird cages first, and then I'm going to explain how you, how a chat, like if you called Max somehow, they're going to tell you to square your car. I don't want to show both. It's just kind of a time consuming process to get it just right. So I don't want to make the video too long. So I'm going to kind of explain it. And then as I show you how I would square my rears or how I do square my rears, the first way will make sense. So kind of pay attention accordingly. So Ollie got groomed today. So the couple things I'm going to show you guys here with the bird cages. So these are not brand new, obviously, really, really worn, but the seals have been out of the bearings. The bearings have been gone through. They're hundred percent new bolts all the way around. I kept the other ones as spares, just doing the car over the winter. I prefer to just put, put new bolts in. These are steel. I mean, you can see the kind of gold there. I just cleaned these up on the wire wheel because I don't know. I like to, I guess. And, you know, it's just going to make it, I guess, a little bit thinner for your Heim to go on. But there's going to be a bunch of grease there, so that's not a huge deal. So I wanted, what I wanted to hit on first is I've never personally ran tie bolts here. But you're not supposed to. Because you use a chromoly or steel Heim that's going to go on here. They say that the friction is bad when it's a titanium bolt versus and a steel. This is a steel heim. We actually have chromoly heims in the rear arm. So it'll be a chromoly heim on there. But it being two different kinds of metal and it can get warm. Um, they say it can make it bind up or kind of like get sticky. So I would just run a steel there. I do run steel here as well. Only because I would rather this bend than break. And a tie, titanium bolt is more likely to break whereas steel is more likely to bend. So, you know, that could keep you on the track and out of the work area potentially. So I just run steel here, but it's perfectly fine. I know a lot of guys that do run tie. So that's the biggest thing with the bird cages. So I've got everything. I believe everything we're going to need here. So we've got our bird cages. We've got a Jacob's ladder. We've got our blocks, which I'll go over. We've got our Heim for the where the ladder is going to hook onto the bird cage. I use these PVCs instead of putting all my spacers on. I use PVC pipe to lock everything in. We've got our left rear, right rear radius rod, and we've got our two arms here, our left rear and right rear. So you won't need your stops, which I've got down here. You won't need those until after the squaring process is over because your setup blocks are going to be a totally different height. So you don't want to put your stops on yet. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to jack up the rear so that I can get blocks under it on my own. So this is a one inch raised rail car. So I'm going to, we're going to use six inch blocks. And when I say that, as you can see, they're labeled five and six. So raised rail means that your left rail is actually an inch higher than the right rail. So like if if you put the car flat and then you cut all the tubes on the left side an inch shorter, that's what I mean. So really when the car is level, this tube, this bottom rail is gonna be an inch higher than your right. So that is why we've got a five and six inch block because you want the car to be level. So if you don't have a raised rail car, you're going to want two six blocks. There have been half inch raised rails. They're not very common, but if you have that, then you're going to want a five and a half and a six 
or you know whatever block you may go to. So we're gonna do this on six. I know guys that are on seven inch blocks, so a seven and a six. And I know guys who don't really use a block. They, they might put a block under it, but really what they're doing is they're getting their arm even. So there's a lot of options there. I kind of switch between the six and seven. It just depends what track I'm going to and whatnot. So a lot of the information on that stuff I have isn't really mine to give. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but six inch is standard. And that's what Maxim is going to tell you to put it on. That's what I'm going to put it on. What I would say I normally am on other than when I'm experimenting. So that's what we're going to go with. Putting these blocks on is definitely not the most fun thing to do alone. So if you can get a hand, I definitely suggest it, but I do not have an extra set of hands right now. So I already know just from looking at this thing that I gotta go a lot forward. All right, so we're as close as I can eyeball it here. So the next thing you're gonna wanna do, which we will grease them, but not yet, is we're gonna get our bird cages on first. The spacers kind of went over in the last video. We're gonna slide those on first. And then we're gonna go with our bird cages. Like I said, no heim here yet. Until we get this rear in place, there's just no need. So all the ears face inward. And then, like I said, you can use these PVCs. They are three and a half outside diameter. I want to say they're about three inch inside diameter. And they're the proper length. And then you're just going to cut accordingly. So the main reason we're doing this now is because once we go get in, once we start getting this thing in line, we don't want to be making movements that are going to potentially shift where the axle is at. So you want to get these locked down before you really get too far or you're going to get it right or what you think is right. And then you're going to go to tighten one of these and you're going to move the axle like I just did there. It walked backwards on me. So. Those are snug. All right, so that's just holding the bird cages and everything kind of tight together. So the biggest thing here, you can 100% use a tape measure. I'm gonna show you this, what I use. So this is only a little flimsy if I really, really try but this is extremely sturdy, so I use this. So obviously the numbers go different directions, right? So as you can see my line here, that is so that I measure from the, I always start on the same end, which I'll show you. But you're gonna be, if you have a 40, uh, whether it's an 8840, 8740, 8640, if your back half is 40 inch car, that's your motor plate to your rear axle, you're gonna be 38 and 5 eighths of an inch from the face of your rear axle to the face of your motor plate. So if you've got an 87, 40 and a half, you're just gonna be a half inch longer. So you're gonna be 39 and an eighth. If you've got an 88, 41, then you're gonna be uh, uh, 39 and 5 eighths. So just add you know, the half inch to that number depending on what your car is. So what we're gonna do is we're always gonna measure off the face here, right? And I'm probably not even close. Well, I'm probably a little close. Yeah, so I'm, I'm about 
maybe a 16th off. I'm actually really close there. So the idea, I guess I didn't explain this part. So the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna get the rear axle perfectly parallel to the motor plate is what we're gonna do. Now, if you called back some, or if you went with what I kind of call the old school way, which is the original way I was taught, and I know guys are still doing it, and it's not wrong, but it's definitely gonna change what, what bars the car likes, you know, like it's gonna change the feel for the driver. It's gonna change a lot of things. So I don't think either is right or wrong. It's just kind of whatever the driver prefers and you know, what the rest of your package might seem to like. So I know a lot of good cars that do it the you know square where you're parallel. And I know a lot of guys that are gonna do it the way I'm gonna show you. So if you call Maxim, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your right side perfectly, you know, 38 and 5 eighths from the face to the face. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your, your rear end. So like you might measure off the valve, like the cover here, not valve, but the rear end cover to here. And then, you know, maybe measure off the side of your torque ball. I know guys that do it both ways. When I square that way, I check both. And if you do it that way, well, you'll know if your torque tube isn't straight. Cause if you're, you know, perfectly centered back here and your torque tube's not, then either the snout of your rear is bent or your uh, torque tube is. So I would check both if you're gonna do it this way. So right side, 38 and 5 eighths, perfectly dead center. And then you're gonna make sure that this is still perfect at 38 and 5 eighths, you know, and every little bit matters. I don't think a 64th matters, you know, but a 16th definitely does. So you wanna be right on 38 and 5 eighths. Now what that's gonna do, just the way the rears are, how everything sits, your left side, it can end up 38 and 5 eighths, but all the cars I've had were either a 16th short or an eighth short. So what I mean by that, instead of 38, and five eighths, I might be 38 and a half, and I might be 38 and what is that, nine sixteenths. And that's normal. It's actually normal to be a sixteenth or an eighth off when you're squaring it that way. I don't know the exact reason why, but I do know that you're never, if it, the only way you could possibly get perfectly parallel and perfectly centered is if you put stuff in a bind, like if you really forced it. And that's not good at all. The whole idea is for this stuff to be as free as possible. So to me, doing it the old school way or, you know, where you're kind of short here, but you're centered, I think it kind of makes the car a little bound up. At least that's how it feels. Feels like you really have to try. You have to, you have to try a lot harder to get the car to turn and then you maybe kind of break it free. And that's hard to explain exactly what that is. But basically you're so tight that you end up breaking the car free and then you're loose on exit. So the way that I do it, I feel like the whole car, the corner is a lot easier and more fluid, at least for me. And I kind of like to make up speed on corner exit or that's where I seem to. So the other way I think is maybe you're a little free on entry, but you usually have more drive off the corner. So that's how I like my car. So that's how I'm gonna square mine. So we'll get back into this. I'm not going to carry the camera back and forth a whole bunch of times. It might take me 10 times back and forth to get this perfect where I like it. So I'm going to let you guys hang out on this side. But basically, you know, depending on what direction I want to go, I'm just going to kind of bump the axle and whatnot. And I guess I might as well just go ahead and get this one perfect but as i when i go bump the other side it's going to move this side you know maybe half as much so it's kind of a uh fight back and forth this isn't something you need to rush this is an extremely important part when it comes to building the race car and having a free and a fast car so definitely measure a hundred times and tighten it all once. As you can see, sometimes it's not really even moving and sometimes it's just a tick too much. So I like that right there. So we're gonna walk around to the other side here. So 
So yeah, on this side, I'm definitely about, I'd say about a 16th too short again. So we'll get this side dead nuts. And then for sure, when I come back over there, it's going to have moved it, you know, just a touch. So we'll just keep going back and forth until we're happy. I was actually way closer than I thought I was. If you use, I kind of just use the torque tube, kind of the wear mark there, like I said. And that got me really close. So, yeah, so now we are a bit long, or longer than I would like to be here. So, and definitely, I mean, I'm not saying put a level on whatever you're using to measure back and forth, um, but try to hold it, you know, up against the frame, you know, straight, um, you know, pretty level or at least in the same spot every time. Um, so, yeah, this is going to barely need anything. But it's important to measure the same way, same spot every time. All right, so I'm a big fan of that. I think that's about as good as I can get. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab a couple torsion bars so that we've got something to line or to put our arms on. So it looks like I've got, actually, you know what? I'm not gonna break out the new ones yet. I'm just gonna grab a couple used ones from the mule. This part really does not matter as long as your torsion bar is straight. The thing could be 20 years old and it just, it's not gonna have any effect positive or negative or otherwise. One important thing I'll mention now while we do, you wanna label all your torsion bars. Obviously you can see this is just a little bit of surface rest from sitting in the mule all winter. You know, that'll come off with some scotch Bright, and I'll probably clean it even before we race. But as you can see, potentially, that's marked right rear. So. I do have a set of bars, you know, basically a 975, a 1,000, a 1015, a 10 and a quarter. I have four of each that are just, right? There's a left front, a right front, a left rear, and a right rear of each. And then I've got a, another set of just two of everything, and it's left front, right rear, and right front, left rear. So you never want to put, like, you don't want to take a bar out of the left rear and put it in the left front because you want them to always twist the same direction. So some bars, this does not, some brands have like a little star on the edge here, but with like Schroeder's, you've just got your marking here. So the important thing is this is my right rear, you know, which is going to go over there. So I'm always going to put this marking to my torsion arm side, no matter what corner of the car it's in. And these will normally get greased, but for purposes of squaring the car, there's absolutely no need to go through that. So the, what made me think of that, actually, I wasn't thinking, I was thinking I was putting right front end. Either way, that's a big, big deal. Do not put the bars in the wrong corner. I mean, you can basically make one useless by doing that. So as you can see, my, my dedicated left rear is in the other car. So this is one that's labeled left rear and right front. And that's just so that I know that this bar has been in both, whereas the other bar strictly only goes in a, like a left rear or the right front. And that's not mandatory if you don't have that many bars. If you've got two of each bar, that's, you know, that's fine. You can have a right rear and left front and a right front left rear, and it's not gonna be a problem at all. So the Himes here, barely spun in. I just kind of got them started. You wanna grease these. We're not gonna go all the way into this jam nut. Like that's gonna come back some, but I just barely started them so that you guys could kind of go through that with me. So we'll get these on. You don't need to torque these while you square the car it's just important to have them on there and have them snug so they can't slide around on the bar 
All right. So, and what I meant by level, you know, some guys will get basically they, they will put their stops on, but they'll put them on back, like upside down, so that you can actually put weight in the car and raise the rear. So they'll kind of get everything where they think it's going to need to be, you know, front to back, etc. And then they they put this weight in with the stop on upside down until this rear arm is perfectly level with the car. We're not going to do it that way. And there's probably a step there that I'm maybe missing, but that's not the way that I normally do it. So I've done it once with somebody. And yeah, that was that. So big thing here, all your radius rods are always going to have this little like groove on one end. And that's to tell you that this is the left hand nut. On your left hand, on your left side of the car, this, these are going to face outwards. Like, so if they're on the left front, they're going to face towards the front of the car. If they're on the left rear, they're going to face the back of the car. On the right side, those are going to face inward. So on the right front, you know, like this will be back towards the, the center of the car. And on the right rear, it'll be kind of forward towards the center of the car. So these are going to be close, but they're not quite set. I need to grab, these are the bolts that are going to go through the frame, through the radius, through the heim on the radius rod and hold the radius rod to the frame. So we're going to put just a touch of grease on here. And actually, I don't think I really even showed you guys what I use. McMaster car makes this stuff. This is what I grease all my bolts with. It's a high pressure lube, really nice. So I'm just going to barely, I'll show you guys once I get it on there, barely put any on, you know, the front of the threads just to make sure if there's somehow a burr on our nut that's welded on there. This isn't going to catch that and kind of give me a false tight or, or chew it up. It'll, this grease will allow it to really just slip on through. And then lubing the shoulder is definitely not necessary. I mean, you don't have to do it. I don't know if there's any real benefit to it. I just don't see that it's ever going to hurt, right? But it could. It could help. And it's not something I re-grease all the time. Maybe if they come out and they look like they've collected some dirt and whatnot, then I will. Uh, but it's not part of my weekly maintenance. So I'll just show you guys on this one. As you can see, just barely on the front there. And then I just kind of, I haven't smeared it yet. I'm just going to let the radius rod and hold that this goes in to do the work for me. So on a Maxim, if you've got a standard Maxim, you know, or you haven't ordered your radius rod heights to any specific height or you haven't ordered the three or the adjustable whatever then standard is going to be the bottom hole on this side and you're going to be in the top hole on your right side you can play with that so you can Really, it just kind of changes the birdcage center or whatever. I, I haven't played with it a lot. I know if it gets really, really slick out, I'll actually just move my left side up, and that's going to roll the birdcage a little bit more than we pre-roll. So I would definitely just stick to standard until you, like, get a nice car where, like, if you're third place every night, right, and you can't do any better, then maybe start playing around. But that top bottom hole is not going to be a huge effect or you know give you an extra half a second of speed or or whatever so there are guys that are smarter about that stuff than me though so i don't go making changes on stuff that i don't 100 percent know what it's gonna do and i haven't gotten to the point where i'm playing with that yet Another thing to note, when I 
put that nut on there to hold the radius rod, you probably couldn't tell, but I did not put a wrench on it because I got it as tight as I can, which is fairly snug, but I do not want to risk this axle moving either side to side, front to back, anything. So if you go to tighten that without an arm on it, it's going to try to roll the axle, which we do not want right now. The reason we're going radius rods first here is because the radius rods you can spin right while they're you know completely on and that's going to change your timing in the bird cage and with the torsion arm obviously you can spin this heim but once it's on that bolt you can't right so you're going to want to do the radius rods first get your timing where you want it and then we're going to you know push this up back and forth whatever so i'm going to grab i've got a digital level here it's probably as old as i am you can use a standard one but this is definitely something that you're going to want to be pretty precise at so i will bring you guys over here so i can show you what i mean so when i do my bird cages you don't want to just time it at say a degree or two degrees or zero degrees, whatever that number is, right? Because if you're in a different spot in your shop, et cetera, you know, or even if you think you're in the same spot, you're probably not and it can change. So what you're gonna wanna do is go under your Jacob's ladder here, right? So I've got one degree with an up arrow, right? So that means I'm, I'm one degree that way, you know? So I'm gonna come to the bottom of my birdcage here, this flat part, and that's where we're gonna check. So if I'm, so I'm about 1.2, which is, well, yeah, so I'm 1.2. So I'm actually gonna roll this to one. So that is actually even, right? Because I'm 1.0 here. This is going to fluctuate between 0.9 and 1. There. So we're, we're actually at 0 right now. So I am usually at 0. If I'm at a dead slick track, you know, I might roll the bird cages. But for the most part, I'm even. Again, this is kind of like the radius rod holes. Does it matter? Yeah. Is it something you need to be playing with in the very beginning? I would say no. You know, just pick a number between, I would say zero and two. I know some guys, some guys are over that. But pretty much everyone I know or that I've talked to about it is between that zero and two number. I would say probably two is pretty popular. One and a half, two are probably the most common numbers I hear. So rolling your bird cages is gonna give you, they say it gives you, you know, more grip. You're like pre, you're putting some, you're pre-timing it basically, which, you know, I, I guess they say allows the car to drive like the tires, you know, the tires get drove into the ground harder or, or sooner or, or whatever. So it's not something I've done a whole lot. But, uh, you know, a lot of guys do. And a lot of guys, I, I know guys have gone as high as five just trying it. So I'm going to go zero because that's simple. And, you know, like I said, until I'm, you know, top three every night and I can't seem to get that extra hundred to that, that tick more of speed, you know, maybe I'll start playing with some of that stuff. But for now, standard is the easiest thing to do and just get, get laps, you know, and that's, Someone who's got, you know, uh, over 100 races under my belt now in the last four years and still important to just get laps. So we're going to go standard there. Now what we're going to do, we don't care what the frame rail says over here, right? Because we might not be on even, on even ground. So 
we are just going to go straight to the bird cage and i just so that my my little arrow thing is is the same direction because i don't believe and up it's kind of backwards so i actually look through from this side right and we're like two and 2.5 there like i said i just spun these hinds in all right so there we go now when i talk about rolling your bird cages what you're gonna what you do is you roll them forward and that's rolling your torsion arm forward so you're gonna lengthen your radius rod you're gonna spin it and lengthen it and that's gonna roll this forward I don't know why or how, I don't know like the whatever, geometry, physics, whatever, why that helps you drive the tires better. But I know that like, if it's really slick, like if I'm at Fremont, right? Like I may not actually put timing in these, like by measuring it, cause you don't really have time, but I'll break my jam nuts loose and I might put two turns into this, which is gonna roll the bird cages. Go into somewhere like Knoxville until it's like, unless it's one of those nights where it's crazy slick, I don't see that you need it. So I have played with different blocks and rolling the bird cages, you know, a couple times. And, you know, there's definitely more drive to be had or found, but it, that's not always a good thing. If you're going to a little quarter mile like Jacksonville, you may not want that much drive. So what we're going to do next here without bumping the rear, right? We're going to back this bolt off. Now, I already know that I need to go a lot of turns in here. Because I had just barely started them, right? So that's not going to fit. So you're just going to keep going here. Keep checking. All right, so that might be too much. So we're looking for the bolt to just, yep, I went too far in there. So I'm going to go spin out. And you want your bolt to perfectly slide through that, catch the threads. That seemed pretty smooth, right? So I can easily slide this back and forth. That feels right, but you can always be a half off and it still kind of feel right. So I'm going to roll that one half that way and just kind of see if this feels any better. Yeah, that feels even better. So I will go one more and just make sure this is, you know, the Goldilocks zone. Just be careful that you're not getting too aggressive. Yeah, so we're going to go back in one half turn. To where you might shake the rear end. So... The other thing I meant to show you guys, I'll show you on that side before I bring the arm up. I meant to show you while these were on the bench, just because it's going to be hard to get a camera in here. But we'll figure it out. So you've got like a little protector, you know, it's not really a jam, it's not a jam nut, but it's going to, it's going to hold your bolt head here so that it can't spin because you don't want to bend this flag. So you really don't tighten that down. You just get it to where it's, it's, this can actually fit, which can only fit on the, you know, when it's flat straight up and down like that. And you're not really tight, right? But then once this goes in, that bolt can't move. So this doesn't need to be all the way in right now. So you can see that little nut here, right? So when this is flat, obviously you're gonna tighten this while this is out. I just put it there so that it doesn't get lost. So we'll pull that off. This will get, you know, pretty much tight or just really finger tight, get to where the flat side is where it needs to be. And then you will put this in and that's gonna keep your bolt from spinning. So in the meantime, I sat it right there. But now we're gonna be ready to get this arm Swung up there.
So if this isn't going finger tight, or, you know, if you can't spin this with your finger, then you either need to take your flag off and clean your threads, or your bolt's not as straight as you think it is. So yeah, that's definitely worse. So we're gonna go one spin, or one half spin back in. Right, and that's where I like it. So I cleaned, I, I chased all the threads on these, you know, when they came apart, so that I would know. Maybe this one's still got some stuff in it. Nope, there we go. All right, so the next thing that we can do, now that we've got those up, all right, is we're going to come back. And I'm not too worried about the axle going forward, backwards, etc. now because I'm locked into place. So it might try to rotate, you know, one direction or the other, but it can't actually go anywhere or change positions. So three quarter is going to be what your hymens are. You want to kind of make sure your hymens are spun the same way. That's going to give them the most movement because there's not a lot of movement here. So I don't like, I don't like to put channel locks on these because it'll chew them up real quick, you know, and there's no sense in making new or, you know, fairly new radius rods all chewed up. So I'm going to show you guys kind of the wiggle here, right? So if you had this one all the way rolled that way and the other one rolled the other way, well, then you're going to tighten it, right? And that's going to be stuck because there's just not a lot of room here. So just put them both the same direction, and that way you're going to have as much, you know, of that as you can. So now we can come to this side. We can tighten these down. So I just roll them the way that the, the nut is going to spin so that I don't have to hold the hind. You can get a half-inch wrench and put on there, too, if you wanted to. I don't find that it really helps me. Now you can see here, nice and wobbly. So now we'll tighten up our times that are going on to the birdcage here. So I am going to grab a half inch because there's nothing to hold that high and I want it to stay straight. Half inch wrench is what's going to hold the open end of a wrench will hold that high. So we've got a 15 16 because I run a fat or a bigger jam nut here. As a lot of guys do, it's steel instead of aluminum. I mean, it's just thicker. It's, it's going to give you a little bit better hold, right? So you want your heim to be straight up and down. So I'm going to hold the half inch wrench. I'll hold that heim. With the half inch and just hold it in place while I actually tighten it, you know, with my 15 16. So definitely get those snug. The big thing is, I know some guys that don't even put the jam nut on there because in reality, it can't go anywhere, right? This thing can't spin other than a little bit. But the main reason, you know, I do it and, and most guys do is your stuff spares does, right? Because your spare is not going to be on that if you just have a spare arm made up. So if you don't have the, the jam nut holding it, then that thing could spin rolling down the road, you know, as it's in the trailer, maybe bouncing around in the mule, bouncing around. So that's the only reason we really run jam nuts. So if that thing comes loose, as long as it gets tight before you pull it off to keep it in place, it, it's not the end of the world. But when you've got spares and you've got stuff maybe coming in, come, going on, coming off, and keeping track of how many laps are on stuff, it's better to just get them all tight all the time. And if that comes off in a hurry, you know, that thing is not loose and then had changed. So 
Next thing we're going to work on here, never know what height is going to be right, is our Jacob's Ladder. So I'm just going to pick this up a bit and move that back. Our pins here. So this pin is going to hold the Jacob's Ladder. The, the short, fat one is going to hold your Jacob's Ladder here to your heim. These two hold your ladder here. This is a spacer, which goes in there. So obviously that's going to be shown here, but I grease all of these as well. These are, I think, a pretty important thing to grease. If you have to change a ladder in a hurry and you haven't greased it and say the ladder hasn't come off in 10 nights, it could be a real pain to get these off. So we're going to grease these up. Those are really close. So on my ladder here, I run Stevie's bolts to hold my straps on. The, the really cool thing about this is the head. It's one of the, you know, it's another one where it's a flat head and then you use an Allen here. The reason those are so good is you're gonna put that flat head towards the axle. And if you break the ladder straps, which is not hard to do, you know, it's a really small, wall tap can break the ladder straps and allow this thing to flop around. You've got a smooth surface. So instead of a bolt head grinding into the axle and then potentially making it eventually break in half, which is really common, you know, you could look at a lot of axles in the pit area and you'll see a groove here where it's, you know, it looks like it's been machined and it's from a bolt on a ladder. So th these will keep your axles nice. We're going to grab our two spacers here. So we're going in the middle hole. I really am not positive what Maxim would say is standard. This is, I would say not. You're probably in your inner. So you've got different ladder sizes. This is a 13 and 5 eighths, which is 100% standard. There's guys, and actually I'll show you just because I know everyone measures. Not everyone, but there's kind of two ways. To measure. So when I say 13 and 5 eighths, I mean that if you go down the leg from the center of one hole to the other center, you're going to be 13 and 5 eighths. But like if you went to the center here, you know, you're only 13. So that's important if you're ordering ladders or whatever, make sure that you are very specific because there's 14 inch ladders, there's I want to say maybe some like 13 and a quarters or 13s. There's like really probably three sizes that are all standard and that's going to determine just where your ladder will most likely be. So I'm in the middle here really with this ladder. I should be in the inner hole. And I'll show you what I had to change in order to be in this hole like I wanted. All right, so you can see, you know, flush, got that little bit out. That pin is going to take a cotter pin. No. Alexis, back talking again. I'm glad I got her for Christmas like years ago because if I would have spent money on her, I'd be pissed. So go ahead and put our pins in here. They make these in steel again. These are from, mine are titanium from uh, Smith, from Stevie. That one's 
must be pretty new. The pen is because it's being it's a little snug. I don't like that. So I'm not sure what's not allowing. I don't know what's stopping it. Maybe just spinning it will help. There we go. Yeah, so that one's super tight. The pin itself, not the cotter pin. The... whatever you would call this pen, uh, you know, the rod going through could almost be just a tick longer on this. And that could just be that this, you know, it looks like there's a big gap here. So, you know, it could just be that this, this tab on the bottom is maybe just a 16th further out than it should be. Cause these pens are really made to be just long enough. So there's that part, right? And then you can see ladder is going to swing up like so. So I'm going to check one thing here. Yeah, so I'll have to kind of show you guys. So normally, right, like because I'm running my ladder in just a ever so slightly different location, you know, like one pinhole further outwards than you normally would with this ladder size. When I slide this up, right, let me just grab the pen and slide it in so it holds one side of this. Right, so as you guys can see, not a ton of threads there. So I am gonna go on the inside here, but because I often even come one ladder further, one, I don't know if you can see, yeah. I'll, I'll often come out one side further. I've actually, I mill down these, these are usually fatter. I mill them down and they'll go on the back side, right? Because my hymen will be so spun in that I need this on the back side. But as you can see, I've got plenty there and I'm not gonna have any on that outside part. So let's get our grease. And then depending on how much this moves it, I might even add a little bit of grease before we put it into the bird cage. This is a steel heim here. Like I said, on the arms, chroma chromoly, chromoly, chromoly is, I would say, proper. They say that's that's stronger than steel. Even you definitely don't want one of those to break. You will be going for a ride for sure, and not the fun kind. All right, so we're just gonna. Raise that up and check. I think I'm actually probably half a turn, maybe a full turn too far. So check that. All right, so I don't think I'm going to get better than that. So I'm going to let that down. I'm going to throw some grease on here. Again, super important that all your ladder bolts really have have grease are free etc you you don't want this to be bound up at all ever at least not while you're on six inch blocks or while you're sitting on the ground the only thing i can say that's maybe advanced you start playing with seven inch blocks really what you're doing is your ladder may not be really free and your torque torque tube may not or torque ball may not be really free when you're sitting on the ground but when you're actually at speed right so you're at like race heights instead of you know sitting on the ground heights your ladder will be free so that's kind of what you're what guys you know why guys started trying that and what they're trying to accomplish there is to make it where maybe their ladder is not free sitting on the ground like everyone's done for all the all these years but when this thing's on the track at speed and kind of, you know, like sandwiched down, you know, from the wing, winged over onto the left rear a little bit, this would be 
free. So, you know, as you can see, wobbly back and forth. So we're gonna again grab our half inch wrench and our 15 16 so that we can hold this time straight up and down. You won't have, if you do run Stevie's Jacob's ladders, which I will say are amazing. I tried a couple last year and I really liked them. They are more expensive. And I had so many of these left that those two had gotten hurt and came off. And I just figured that I would start wearing these out since I already bought and paid for them. But I actually do have a Heim right here so that you can see the difference, right? So this is narrower. This is actually, instead of a half inch, like pen, I don't know why I can't think of that word. This is going to be a 3.8, so it takes a smaller, man, that's pissing me off, pen there. And as you can see, it's not a, a normal Heim, so there's not actually something that spins, but you don't use a jam nut. I mean, you can to just, you know, hold it in place so that this can't spin when it's not on there or whatever, right? But yeah, and then his ladders, basically the difference is instead of welds here and whatnot, the the legs are laser cut, the, the back part here, laser cut, and then they're actually like laser drilled and everything, and there's pins going through. So Whereas these are welded and yeah, they're putting a jig, they can be off just a tick, you know, a 16th, a 32nd, whatever. And Stevie's is not like they are all, you know, to a thousandth of an inch, right? Dead nuts. So they really are nice. That's what I would run if I didn't already have a lot of these. Ladders are kind of cheap and you can break them. So, you know, I've got, you know, pretty easily. So I've got, you know, probably 10 of them and probably 20 sets of straps. So as you can see here as well, that ball is super free. So that's what you're going for. Other than, like I said, if you start messing with other blocks and trying to get to where your stuff will be free at race heights, you're not going to be able to check that really in the shop. If you go to a pull down rig, which is, you know, expensive, there's not a lot of them, but then you could test that stuff because it'll just pull the car down with straps and whatnot where it would be while it's racing and you can just walk around and touch stuff. So I've never been to one of those, but they are incredibly cool. So that is square in your rear end, you know, and I really wanted to, you know, say we're good, right? Hook the brakes up and there we go. So I'm going to just leave it on the squaring on these blocks for right now. In the next clip, we're going to go, uh, well, probably won't be a clip for you guys. I'm going to pause, save the video, etc. We're going to get to the front end. So I still got to, I got to tear one apart so that I can build the front end with you guys. And then squaring it and whatnot once we build it is way quicker. So we'll do that next. And then once we get that done, we'll go ahead and set this thing, the rear and the front down onto ride height blocks and i'll show you guys how you're going to put your stops on how you would put turns in take them out etc on that once we get both we'll just do all that at one time so right now you know i guess the only other thing is i'm looking at it i'll probably say this 10 more times and i've said it a few i'm not used to uh like talking and going through this stuff as I do it. So as you could tell, these were not tight, which doesn't take much. Back that off just a tick. Get our little stopper. Now the stopper, you know, little bolt or I think it's a 1032 Allen. That is something you want to get tight. So, because the, the normal bolt, 
is not stopping that from turning. So these bolts will get grease on them. I'm just not doing it now because this card's going to sit for hopefully all year because it's a spare card. So hopefully I never need it. But I will explain real quick what I do is I just get a thin layer on my bolt before I even put it through. And then I put it through. And then what you're going to want to do, I use a red and tacky from Lucas Oil. What you're going to do is I use my, my uh, grease gun, right? And I build a full, like a nice big fat layer on both sides around the high man. What I think, you know, I've talked to a lot of guys and I, I don't think people understand is you're not putting grease on this bolt so that the thing can slide. I mean, you are, but the, the purpose of grease is to build a dirt barrier so that dirt can't get in there. So I know a lot of guys are like, oh, if you put that much grease on it, it's dirty. And well, yeah, that's kind of the point. So you want a lot of grease there to, to build yourself a barrier so that dirt doesn't get on the bolt or, you know, in the little crevice, you know, the, the fraction of a hair between the heim and the bolt, that's where you don't want to get dirt. So you build a little, you know, grease layer there and i'm sure some people are listening to this going man that's that's stupid everyone should know that but i didn't you know when i started so it's definitely not something that's stupid i just don't think most people you know it's something that most people would not even you know bother talking about if they did know right one of those things that maybe sounds stupid so yeah so that's all tight and and like i said i don't want to go putting grease on those right now cuz this thing's going to sit till at least April when I race, you know, and it's barely the first of February now. So it'll just collect dust and I'll have to clean it. So not worth putting grease on those right now. I'll, I'll put it, grease on it before this thing goes in the trailer for the beginning of the year as a spare. And hopefully we don't need it, but it'll be ready in case we do. So yeah, we'll get the front end going next. And like I said, we'll, we'll square that up block the rear and front and then uh, we'll get into like tail tank and and the fuel lines to that and then we'll be uh, looking to go to the motor.